Hello, welcome to part two of Spirituality of the Triduum. This part on a spirituality of Holy Thursday. My goal in these final parts is to look at these days through the lens of Jesus' own experience. Indeed, this is what we should participate in when we celebrate the Eucharist. For as the disciples discovered on the road to Emmaus, we come to know him in the breaking of the bread. Not just know about him, but to know his very self, his very experience. From the scriptures themselves, we can get some understanding of Jesus. I say some understanding because remember, theology is not an empirical science. So let's go back, way back, as indicated in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the reality of the Son before the Incarnation. Let's look at it this way. When God speaks His Word, it is the perfect image of God. In a sense, to be Son is to be a total perfect yes in God. God in the Son, the Son in God. This is seamless, natural in the Godhead. But in the Incarnation, this will change. To enter the human condition is to enter, if you will, a fallen order. And it will cost him. We hear this expressed wonderfully in the second reading of Palm Sunday from Philippians. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness. Theologians apply a Greek term to this, kenosis, which is the Greek word for emptying. To accomplish the Incarnation, the Son of God will empty himself as the man, Jesus. As Son, he deserves the glory and power of the Godhead. As the incarnate word, Jesus, he will empty himself of that. In other words, as a divine person, he continues his identity as the perfect image of the Father, the unending yes to God. But in the human condition, that yes will no longer be seamless. It will cost him dearly. Let's bring that understanding into the final days of Jesus' life. Remember, we're looking at the human experience of Jesus of Nazareth. In the space of a couple of days, he has gone from a triumphal entry into Jerusalem to one who would be imminently arrested as a criminal and sentenced to death. Truth be told, he didn't have to be God on Thursday to see this coming with Friday sunrise. This was the moment of truth. Would he continue to be the perfect son, even at the cost of his very life? All his life and the tradition of his faith said that God was faithful. God was Abba, the daddy who caught you, always caught you when you fell. But now in the midst of secular disaster, Holding fast to that trust would be as painful as the physical torture to which he would be subjected. In these Holy Thursday moments, Jesus experiences the most basic questions of humankind. Why is there evil? Why do the evil triumph and the good suffer? And for the person of faith, is God present? Is God a monster? calling people to live his will, though it ends in suffering and death? Or is God somehow still the Abba, the Daddy who catches us? 
in the Holy Ex Thursday experience of the Last Supper, Jesus demonstrates his resolution to these basic questions. The fact that it happens in the context of a Passover meal is no accident. Jesus' faith tradition, and ours, tells us that this is the commemoration of God's saving act, the liberation from slavery, and the passing from captivity to freedom. The three synoptic gospels all portray this last meal as such. And though John's gospel, the latest and most theological, does not name it as a Passover meal, this happens because John puts Jesus on the cross at the exact same time as the lambs are being slaughtered in the temple for Passover. And the connection is clear. Now the bread of Passover was known as the bread of affliction from which God would save his people. The cups of wine, though cups of suffering, were still the cups of blessing, blessing God in whom they trust. Yet in this meal, Jesus does something extraordinary. In fact, something so extraordinary, the disciples would have been stopped in their tracks. The Passover meal ritual was very clear but Jesus breaks that pattern twice. After blessing the bread, he says something that might have puzzled his friends in the moment, but which became all too clear soon enough. He shares the bread with the words, this is my body. And when he takes the last cup of blessing and passes it, he says, this is my blood poured out for you. This would have almost scandalized his good Jewish friends. But Jesus' intention was clear. He was now the bread of affliction. He was the cup of suffering. He has resolved his existential questions by choosing to continue his yes, to trust that somehow God would be faithful, all appearances to the contrary. For our final consideration of Holy Thursday, the Gospels give us one of the most human moments of Jesus' life. Think for a second. Have you ever made a difficult, even painful decision, only to find the implications come crashing into your consciousness in a new way afterward? You thought about it, steeled yourself, and made the commitment. But then the doubts rise up the fears, the consequences. Didn't Jesus go through all of this in the Garden of Gethsemane? He had made his choice known to be broken like bread and poured out like the blessing cup, but now it crashes down on him. He even prays that God would actually revoke his decision. Father, take this cup away. But finally, after praying in blood and sweat and tears, he resolves anew to continue his yes, now to the ultimate cost. The Gospels say that God sends an angel of consolation to him. God doesn't take the cup away, but instead consoles the son for the most difficult part of the journey. And we'll see, through Friday and Saturday, this dynamic will return, and forevermore, we will not need the angel of consolation, for Jesus himself will be our angel. Jesus himself will be our consolation, for he has gone before us. As a response to these reflections for each of these three days, I invite you to take some time to read this day's events in the Gospels. But do not just read. As St. Ignatius counseled, use your imagination. Try and experience these events from the inside out. 
Do you pick up on some of the things I mentioned? Do you find something new, something different? Of course, the story is not over. And as we know, it does get worse before it gets better. And we will explore that in part three. Thank you.